Welcome back. The State of the Union conference goes on and we carry on with our program that is packed with the sessions, one-to-one -one conversations and debates. Here this year for the 10th anniversary of the conference, we're discussing Europe in a changing world. We have already heard today on how this world is changing and what we need to do to change it and to make it better. We've heard from the general director of the World Trade Organization and then from the global stage and from the global picture. We also have moved to Europe and you've listened there and you've joined us for the session and the conversation with Christine Lagarde, uh, the president of the European Central Bank. And we're gonna be staying a little bit here in Europe because next here on the program, we're gonna have a special session. This is the State of the Union lecture and for this one I'm inviting all of you to go to the event platform to use the Q&A box there to watch us on live stream on the website and also join us on the social media because you will have this opportunity to ask questions and send your comments to what you think about Europe in a changing world and how is it changing and how you think it should change. Do use the hashtag SOU2021. We're looking forward to having you on board for this session for this special lecture New world, new rules. Can Europe rise to the challenge? Here with me on stage is Jean Pisani Ferry, Tomasa Padoa Skiopa, Chair of the European University Institute. Thank you, Sasha. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a privilege to be delivering this, this lecture uh, now. Um, and uh, I will be focusing on the question that uh, was uh, introduced by Renaud de Hous in his uh, first uh, uh, initial presentation. Uh, as he said, the, the EU defined itself initially by internal integration, uh, and uh, it was about tearing down the, the walls it, uh, between our economies. But then something happened, globalization came, and with it the questioning uh, about the internal focus as opposed to the uh, external focus. And it was very well expressed at the time by Gordon Brown, who said the EU is about internal integration, but integration is taking place on a global scale. And so this was a challenge, and the answer in 2007 that was provided then by the European Council was to say we want to shape globalization. And I quote, globalization is increasingly shaping our lives. We aim at shaping globalization in the interest of all our citizens based on our common values and principles. And this was back then a very ambitious agenda. It's in an even more agenda, ambitious agenda today, uh, at least because globalization is contested, but as I will develop for many other reasons. So uh, it's uh, important to spell out this agenda and this program of this conference very much emphasized what, uh, what are the main items on this agenda. We spoke of global commons, we spoke of global rules, we spoke of competition, of preserving consumer from global giants, we spoke of strategic autonomy, we spoke of geopolitics. So uh, a series of uh, um, issues and what I want to do uh, now is to sort of present a series of points about these issues um, to elicit questions, as we said. Uh, some of these points will be hopefully controversial. Well, let me start with the obvious. The external action is now the EU's new purpose. And the question immediately is, is it realistic? Can the EU make a difference? Is it big enough? Depends on the field, obviously. But in many fields, I think this was said and said again, and this is right, the EU is big enough to make a difference. It has two characteristics that nobody will dispute. It has a very large market that no producer can afford to be excluded from. And it has the capacity and the will to act as a global regulator. This is sometimes contested, but it's a fact also. So it's right to uh, question what the EU should do, but I don't think we should be questioning whether the EU can make a difference. So what I want to do is to analyze the context in which the EU is operating, to draw lessons from experiences with uh, global governance, 
and conclude on the open agenda. I will, I will partially draw on uh, work done here with George Papa Constantino, who was uh, right now with Christine Lagarde. Uh, we are uh, together co-directing a project on the transformation of global governance. So the new context. The first thing is that the pandemic shock and the arrival of the new US administrations are major game changers. And this is fairly obvious, but just think what we, have, we, would, we would have discussed if we had had this conference a year ago as it was initially programmed, without COVID and with Trump. We would have essentially, I suppose, expressed disillusion with global governance. We would have spent half of the time discussing our differences with the US and we would have probably settled on a minimalist agenda. So times have changed. Uh, there is something new. Uh, there is this administration and there is a pandemic, which is really a wake-up call. The pandemic has illustrated the, the cost of the lack of joint action and uh, the incredible balance between the cost of inaction and the cost of joint action. The cost of inaction are way, way above whatever uh, can be the cost of action. Uh, so this is a wake-up call, and I think it was very well expressed by a climate economist called Gernot Wagner, a uh, German working in the US, uh, who said the pandemic, in effect, was climate change at warp speed. So everybody realized on this occasion what the nature of the problem we're facing uh, and the importance of the issue of global commons. So that's my next point. My next point is that global commons are increasingly taking prominence over integration. The world that was built uh, and that was our world for the decades after the Second World War was a world dominated by the issue of integration. The project was to create prosperity through integration. That was the purpose of the international rules, international institutions. But we're facing a paradigm shift, and this paradigm shift is that health, climate, biodiversity, uh, even digital networks, uh, certainly the outer space, they're global commons. They're not about primarily integration. They are not about rules of the game. They're about collective action. Um, and here, uh, we have to be careful because there has been an abuse of the metaphor of the global public good. At uh, some point, you know, people were saying everything is a global public good. This is not true, obviously. And it is not true that any problem requires a global solution. But it's true that uh, there are essential new issues uh, of high prominence that have this character of global commons. So that's another pivot, I would say, uh, as opposed to what happened in the decades uh, after the Second World War. Another uh, lasting change is that systemic heterogeneity has become a global uh, permanent fixture uh, of, the, of the economy, of the global economy. 20 years ago, China joined the WTO. And just before leaving office, President Clinton spoke about China uh, joining the WTO. And what he said is interesting. It's in interesting to reread what he said at the time. He said, by joining the WTO, China is not simply agreeing to import more of our products. It is agreeing to import one of democracy's most cherished values, economic freedom. And he went on explaining by that um, the more China liberalizes, the more it will liberate the potential of the people, and the more the people have uh, power, uh, the more uh, they want to realize their dream and the more they will demand a greater say. Liberty, he said, will spread by cell phone and cable modem, very 20th century, right? Uh, and then he alluded to China trying to crack down on the internet. And his answer was, 
good luck. That's sort of like trying to nail jelly on the wall. That was Bill Clinton in 2000. Times have changed. Now we have the coexistence of two systems. Uh, we have uh, this heterogeneity, the systemic heterogeneity that is with us. We don't have the illusion that the internet will just change uh, uh, China. Um, and we have more. We have more than China. I mean, we shouldn't believe that all the problems we're facing of systemic heterogeneity are about China. They're also about the rejection by emerging countries of um, capital uh, account liberalization. They're also about the divergence on issues like privacy and, uh, and content radiation. So this is another lasting feature. My next point is that there's something else also that's uh, bound to stay with us, which is the interweaving of economics and politics. It's here to stay. The world shaped by the global rules was not an apolitical world. On the contrary, its promotion by, by the US was very deliberately uh, the promotion of a political project. Um, it was uh, to create an environment where the American system and the American values could survive and flourish, to quote from a, a report of the time. But as far as economic integration was concerned, geopolitical issues were more or less put aside. You know, in 19, uh, the, the 1980s, trade between the Soviet Union and the US represented less than a fraction of a percentage point of uh, total US imports. Chinese import, export to the US represent 18% of uh, US imports. So, so this is a completely different world where we cannot separate uh, the economic dimension from the uh, geopolitical dimension. And the idea that uh, economic integration can be managed abstracting from uh, this uh, geopolitical dimension is now being contested. Jake Sullivan, the, the National Security Advisor, wrote a paper in 2020 saying that for three decades, foreign policy professionals largely deferred questions of economics to a small community of experts who run international economic affairs. He made clear that he thought it had to end, and I think he's delivering on this commitment. So we are seeing a different uh, world. Now, what are the lessons from uh, the analysis we can make of what's happening uh, with, uh, with global governance? And I will draw on uh, this research with George Piper Castantino I was uh, alluding to. We, we looked at a series of fields um, going from uh, integration, traditional integration, deep integration, global commons, investigating what's going on, what works, and what doesn't work. And my takeaways would be the following. The first is that economists are wrong, that it's not all about games and incentives. Economists, you know, have uh, their view on these issues of global governance. They think that the problem is that there is a game this game uh, involves incentives not to cooperate uh, in some cases, in several cases, and that governance is about solving this game, creating incentives to uh, cooperate. Um, some games, in fact, are easy to tackle. Some are more difficult uh, because incentives to free ride are, are massive, and climate change is an example. But what are we seeing? We're seeing that in health, where incentive to cooperate is extremely strong. Uh, we've had all the difficulties we've seen with the WHO uh, with, at the various stages uh, with this pandemic. Um, and we've, what we've seen is that the interference of sovereignty, politics, uh, bureaucracy with governance has created problems where supposedly there wouldn't have been uh, problems because the incentive to cooperate is so strong. And we're seeing in climate 
that there is more happening than what economists would have predicted on the basis of the Paris Agreement. Actually, William Nordhaus uh, is very critical of the Paris Agreement, saying, you know, you need, you need a stronger incentive because climate coalitions are unstable. And Jean Tirole, another uh, Nobel Prize, said the Paris Agreement was worse than nothing when it was signed. But as Franz Timmermans said this morning, there is a momentum, there is something happening. And so the lesson is that processes that were not supposed to deliver may deliver something, and that where cooperation is supposed to be easy, it's more difficult than it seems. But if economists are wrong, I think legal scholars are, are also wrong when they say that it's all about treaties and institutions. There is a long tradition that maintains that you know, it's, a, it's a strong, a hard legal framework and strong institution that can deliver uh, actually uh, uh, governance, that can deliver a solution, that it's all a matter of compulsion. But what uh, we would have said uh, 20 or 25 years ago is that if uh, only we had a WTO uh, for investment, if only we had an IMF for the environment, if only we had a global competition authority, problems will be much easier to solve. What are we seeing? We're seeing cracks exactly where we have the strongest institutions. What is in difficulty nowadays is trade, and it's the global financial uh, networks. Let me, everybody knows about the difficulties with trade, let me just emphasize that on the global financial uh, safety nets, um, we're seeing an impressive process of decomposition. We've, see, we've seen East Asia seceding from the IMF, de facto. We've seen Europe building its own uh, financial safety net. We've seen dependency on the uh, US bilateral swap lines. Uh, and now we, we're seeing uh, China having built its uh, own development lending network when clear distrust, not only distance, but distrust and uh, separation, rejection from the multilateral uh, procedures. So this is uh, also something uh, striking that institutions and rule do not do the job entirely. And finally, uh, um, I could say that uh, you know, the hope uh, put some, by some people in multi-stakeholder schemes is just fairly excessive. I mean, uh, having the right people around the table helps. Having private sector involved uh, and having private sector responding to incentives is certainly one of the factors behind the Paris Agreement, as I, as I said. Uh, but as the, what's happening with the governance of the internet demonstrates, the multi-stakeholder model is just not the solution. What we observe, and that my next point, is that success can be found in some unlikely corners. I'd just like to draw briefly the attention on two of them. One is what's happening with competition. Uh, we had uh, Commissioner Vestager. Uh, the ability of the EU to block mergers between uh, major foreign companies, to impose remedies to uh, uh, giants, uh, corporate giants, is extraordinary. But it's not the EU only that is doing that. In fact, it's a system of competition authorities that cooperate informally they have similar mandates, they have a similar philosophy, they have ways of organizing extraterritoriality, uh, and this is a, a system that surprisingly works and delivers. It's probably fragile, I think it is fragile, but it does uh, deliver without an institution, without a system of hard law. And the other example I would take is that the OECD is perhaps about to succeed uh, in cracking down on the uh, tax havens, with obviously the change brought by the uh, decision by the Biden administration uh, to uh, introduce a, a new uh, system of, uh, of taxes, of corporate taxes and minimum uh, global taxes. But the OECD, in terms of an uh, institution, uh, is a very uh, nimble institution that was not at all created to deal with that and didn't have the membership at, in principle to deal with these issues. It has been able to uh, provide the framework where the discussion can be held. 
And so the lesson I would like to draw from it is that nimble, agile institutions are essential uh, to that. So there are no universal success, uh, formula for success, but uh, there, are, there are some key components we can identify. You know? uh, identification of the problem, shared identification of the problem, um, shared expertise, some common principles, transparent mechanism, reporting, uh, all that is essential. But certainly the question comes, what about, what about compulsion? What about the uh, fact where someone does not be, be, behave uh, according to the, to the template? Um, arm twisting is certainly necessary. Uh, there should be no illusion. Uh, it's true with taxation. Uh, it's true with regulation. It's going to be true with uh, climate. The question is, how can it be exerted? Uh, I mean, certainly, we have no institution uh, globally that is able to, to do that. It's going to be done uh, on, a, hopefully, a cooperative basis by a group of countries, uh, but there is a responsibility for each uh, country or for the European Union to uh, think about the way it's uh, going to do it. And I'm going to, this brings me to my agenda for, for the EU with which uh, I, I want to, to conclude. I think the first thing the EU has to do is to work out its response to this interrelation between uh, economics and geopolitics. It's not used to this type of interference. Uh, it has worked on the basis of a clear separation. It has worked on the basis of a primacy of, uh, of economics over uh, geopolitics. Now, uh, it claims the commission claims to be a geopolitical commission. Uh, it claims to have uh, values like economic sovereignty um, that are, have a strong political dimension. Um, I think what's essential is to be clear about the way it's going to be done. And let me take an example. Competition policy can, in some cases, have a sovereignty dimension. You can decide uh, for sovereignty reasons to not to take exactly the decisions that would have been taken on the basis of competition. But this should not be an excuse for uh, distorting competition policy uh, in, a, in a systematic way, and it can easily be so. So I think we need clear procedures to uh, determine when geopolitical dimensions, security dimensions, can lead to alter decisions that would have been taken differently. For, um, on competition ground. And that could be, for example, to give the high representative the possibility to invoke a security clause uh, in a competition decision. The second thing uh, that the EU has to do, and there has been much discussion about that, is to address head-on the trade-off between global commons and integration. Global commons and integration are not necessarily in um, contradiction, but there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs, there are vaccines and IP rights, climate and trade. We talked a lot about CBAM, uh, about the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, it has been discussed in, in various sessions. I think the responsibility here of the EU is extraordinary because it will be the first entity to experiment with the introduction of CBAM. So it's uh, watched the world over, and the way it's going to address this trade-off is essential. Again, there's not necessarily a contradiction, but there can be contradictions. And there, are, there is a question of precedence. And as I said, you know, the world we're entering in is a world where global common weight more than, than integration. The uh, next thing I want to uh, emphasize is that the EU, uh, and that echoes what Christine Lagarde just said, has to do the plumbing that uh, is required to equip for a different world. Um, she spoke about the international role of the euro, and I think that's essential. We have a, an, an international currency that is not completely an international currency, and it is not in, completely an international currency because it lacks the, uh, the safe asset, and because uh, if you use the euro externally, you're not sure that in case of uh, liquidity stress, you're going to be provided with liquidity through swap lines, which uh, is what the uh, US does with partner central banks. And these two difficulties are actually rooted 
in the internal functioning of, of the EU and the, and, and the monetary union. The ECB doesn't have a mandate to develop the euro internationally. Uh, we don't have a safe asset, uh, or we're just starting to build it with the next generation EU borrowing. And the, uh, the EU uh, has not given the, the ECB a mandate to, to extend swap lines and to take the risks that correspond. I mean, the ECB has a domestic mandate. So to do this plumbing is essential. And I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the seriousness, the reality of the EU, EU's commitment to this international role will be assessed on the basis of this plan, plumbing. And finally, let me just conclude on saying uh, this is an issue for us, which is to fight for the global system, not for our privileges in it. Seen from the rest of the world, Europe is overrepresented in international organization. This is an old issue. Uh, we know that. Uh, it's comfortable. We like these institutions because they were built uh, on the basis of, uh, of values and principle which we cherish and because we have a lot of weight in, in, in them. But we're facing a trade-off. The trade-off is do we want to preserve the institutions, to preserve the system, or do we want to preserve our influence? I'm not saying we should surrender unconditionally, but I'm saying we should be really addressing this trade-off. Let me conclude here, and I've been a bit long, but I'd like to uh, take, I uh, see there are questions. Um, there's the first question uh, by Lucas Tsoukalis from Athens, uh, who says we should um, uh, start with our strong assets. Oops, the question is moving on the screen, so I can't read it. Can you put the question back by Lucas Tsoukalis? I'm not seeing the question. I'm not seeing any question. Um, so what, what I think I saw is that, okay, here is back. How far can we go so long we remain uh, uncomfortable with hard power, with different perception of external threat? Okay, so the question is, can we really do it? Uh, knowing that uh, member states have different perception of the external environment, have different perception of threats, have different uh, concerns. My answer would be, don't wait until it happens. Don't wait until a choice has to be made, which obviously is going to be benefiting more or responding more to the concern of a particular member state and not to the concern of another member state. The way the EU addresses these issues is through defining procedures, is through defining rules. And that's exactly what we need. That's why I said for investment or for, for, uh, for competition, we need principles, we need procedures. If we wait until the thing happens and then we have a political discussion on what is to be done, obviously there will be different interests and it's going to end in a stalemate. That's precisely why we need different procedures. And this also applies for uh, investment control. Investment control has to be done uh, on the basis of a clear uh, uh, agreed uh, procedure. I'm told that I've got to end. Uh, thank you very much.